Is it more than a cliche to call LA the dream factory? A place where fantasy comes alive? For over a century, the images and stories created here have been enjoyed on screens around the world. But here in LA, the storytelling leapt from the screen long ago. It became part of our built environment. Southern California practically invented the theme park and perfected the themed restaurant. It became a land of fanciful architecture, of fairy tale houses and rum-soaked tiki bars. How did Los Angeles become a place where you can imagine anything and actually build it? Why do we create fantasy lands? What happens when fantasy and reality collide? LA is an idea as much as a city, a set of hopes and beliefs that inspired millions to move here. But behind the idea of LA are the stories of people, dreamers who realized their vision for Southern California and others who failed. So let's look back and uncover some clues to a forgotten past in the archives. Lost LA explores the untold history behind the fantasy of California. I was recently browsing through an archive of sorts, my family's home movie collection, and was struck by how often I visited theme parks as a child growing up in Anaheim. From Knott's Berry Farm to Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom, Disneyland, in fact, served as a second backyard for my family. With our season passes, we spent countless weekends inhabiting the park's carefully constructed fantasy worlds. It's something most Southern Californians experience, including those who didn't grow up down the road from Disneyland. Our region's most successful shopping malls, places like the Grove at the Farmer's Market or the Americana at Brand, transport shoppers, young and old, to some place or somewhere else. I wanted to get into the mind of someone who brings these types of worlds to life. So I visited the man behind the Grove in the Americana, developer Rick Caruso, at his most recent retail center in Pacific Palisades. So there's a, a really long tradition of, uh, in Los Angeles of, of Angelinos wanting to go to places that transport them to a different time and place. Sure. Uh, and that, you could date that back to the arrival of the film industry. I mean, the film industry is interesting to me, but the studio lots, been so fascinated by. Uh -huh. There's a life, there's an energy, there's, yeah. it, it just, it's very unique. And I always thought to myself, to have an, an office on a studio lot would be so cool. And in actuality, what I've done in my own life is we have our corporate offices at the Grove. We have our own studio lot. Right. Right? <laughs> and now I have an office here at the Palisades. It's our own studio lot. But there's just something so magical about yeah. living in this world that you've created. Yeah. And that's the way the studios are. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. I think that's even true of downtown LA, which today is experiencing a resurgence of sorts. It is. But m many of the buildings, at least in the historic core, were built, what, around the 1910s, 1920s? Right. And they're all in a similar style of architecture. It's a Beaux-Arts architectural style. Right, spectacular and buildings. They are spectacular buildings. Right. LA at the time was trying to, to present an image of itself that was different than what it had already been, right? right? It was mimicking what was going on in Chicago and New York. Right. There is some artifice you know, embedded oh, in that, too. Yeah, of course, of course. And what happens, though, I think also, which is interesting, is some of that artifice then becomes historical in and of itself, right? right? You know, we have an opportunity to do something that creates its own history. Yeah. Because I build these projects with the attitude that they're here forever, right? Long after I'm gone or whatever the case is, the people are still enjoying this. And if I want people to still enjoy it for generations, we have to build something that lasts, just like the buildings you were talking about on Spring and Broadway those beautiful buildings, the architecture. How has the film industry informed you know, the design of places like Palisades Village or the Grove right. or the Americana? The film industry has had a lot of influence yeah. in, in probably ways that they would never expect it to. But I think the main thing that I really took away from movies is this concept that everybody has whatever stress, struggles, friction in their life, right? And if you can take them to a place that they really do feel they've just been transported. There's an emotional connection that you create. What we also did is we hired, in the past in one of our projects out of Calabasas, actually a set designer. Because we were struggling with the architects getting exactly what I wanted. And so there's a book that lists every set designer and I started calling. And by bringing a gentleman named Richard Sawyer, by bringing Richard in and teaming him up with 
the architects, Richard, by definition, had an eye of making things look real and the right scale. Yeah. What he also did for us is he allowed us to tap into the library of the studios because studios have incredible architectural libraries because yeah. they have to build these sets that have to look real. Rick's not alone in his fascination with movie studios. Studio tours of production lots are among the most popular tourist activities in LA, and the tradition goes way back. I was curious how the allure of these dream factories might have influenced other fantasy makers, like Walt Disney. So I consulted one of the leading experts on early Hollywood history, Mark Wanamaker of the Bison Archives. It turns out his offices are located, appropriately enough, on one of Hollywood's oldest studio lots. So today, uh, studio tours are a really popular thing to do if you're visiting LA, or even if you live here, really. Like Paramount yes. has a popular tour. Universal turned that into a theme park. Yes. Uh, but that, that dates way back. At the very beginning, when they were here in 1909, they usually kept their sets to themselves. In other words, on their own studio lot. The tours actually start with the Edison Film Company back to about, I'd say around 1910, 1911, when he built proper studios. The studios themselves were thinking they would advertise their films utilizing this kind of fantasy aspect to the public. So for example, they'd have full page uh, stories in the, uh, in the different newspapers and magazines, whole photographic essays showing the sets and saying, Los Angeles is the world. You can come here and see our sets and this is how we make our films and this is what got people to go to see the films. They also wanted to see where they made them. This goes all the way back to 1915. And interestingly enough, the, the studios uh, started to, uh, to uh, experiment with this as a publicity tool. The biggest sets of all, really, I guess, the epic sets, which became classic is D.W. Griffith's sets for Intolerance. Right. Which uh, stood in 1916, and it stood, uh, I think it was 130 feet high. This is all at the intersection of Sunset and Hollywood, right? Yeah, well, well, you know where the Vista Theater is, yeah. which is Sunset yeah. Boulevard, Hillhurst, um, Hollywood Boulevard, Virgil, right. that, that whole terrible intersection. intersection. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, where the Vista Theater is, is where the Intolerance set stood. And these sets stood for about four years. So they're standing out there for four years, four towering years. over this yes. intersection. It became an international tourist landmark. So D.W. Griffith essentially reconstructed ancient Babylon yes. here in Los Angeles. Absolutely. And then Angelinos were welcome to stroll through Yes, it. they couldn't help it. You drive by and they're 130 foot sets. So people were surrounded by these really sort of surreal themed environments. Now mm -hmm. you fast forward 40 years or so and a man named Walt Disney opens <laughs> opens his Magic Kingdom in Anaheim, where you're essentially walking into a movie, right? That's the well, sort of let's experience talk about Disney. Okay. When he came out here in the early 20s, he went to his uncle's house on Kingswell Avenue, which is about one or two blocks away from the Vitagraph studio in East Hollywood. And he used to go, just like everybody else did, climb up on the fence and look at the sets. Really? He's inspired from this to build something much grander. And so Hollywood, the fake Hollywood, the, between the real and the fantasy, inspired many people like him. In today's Hollywood, a young Walt Disney probably couldn't get away with climbing all over movie sets. And the studio tours Mark described seemed a far cry from full-fledged amusement parks like Universal Studios Hollywood. To learn more about how an industrial plant like a film studio could spawn a massive tourist operation, I knew I needed to speak with the head of NBC Universal's archives, Jeff Pertle. So Universal Studios, uh -huh. it's a you know fully functional production facility. It's a working facility, yep. but people also know it as a theme park. It's Correct. an amusement park. Yep. Um, when did that? When did the modern Universal Studios open as a theme park? The modern. Universal Studios opened as a theme park in July 1964. Mm -hmm. The official grand opening of Universal City was held on March 15, 1915. The general public was invited to come see how movies were made, and about 10 to 15,000 people showed up. Wow. <laughs> These were the bleachers that were constructed for visitors to Universal City to see how productions were made. And in these areas below the bleachers, you can see all these different doors. These were each dressing rooms. So the players in all of the films could go in here and change clothes for each scene. 
So you buy a ticket for the studio tour, you could accidentally bump into a, a movie star. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it was a frequent occurrence, I'm sure. And so how long did this go on for? It was obviously very popular at the beginning, and mm -hmm. how long did it survive? So in the beginning, people were invited to cheer the heroes, to boo the villains. They were invited to be interactive in all of these productions because it was during the silent era, <laughs> and it didn't matter. You didn't have a boom mic in front of you, and you didn't have to worry about all this excessive noise in the background. So the crowds could be as loud as they wanted. However, at the advent of sound in the late 1920s, there was a need for quiet sets. And so it's with that advent of sound that the studio had to cease inviting the general public to see how movies were made. So Universal went a few decades without a, a studio tour. That's right. And then Lou Wasserman saw these photos, supposedly. Then, <laughs> right. Lou Wasserman and his executive vice president, Al Dorskin, were trying to think of new ways to generate revenue at the studio. Studio legend has it that they saw these photographs and thought, why don't we start inviting the public back to the studio to see how movies were made? And so that was the genesis of the idea for the modern studio tour. That story speaks to the enduring value of archival collections. Imagine how many millions those photographs made for Lou Wasserman and Universal. More importantly, the photos wonderfully document how the film industry has been transporting Angelinos to different times and places for more than a century. And not just through tours. Once upon a time, outposts of unreality were popping up all over Los Angeles. Well, for anybody who's been, for instance, to Hollywood Highland, you've got a full-size replica of the Intolerance set that was uh, W.D. Griffith, right? And that was originally where the Vista Theater is, which I forget what the two streets are, but um, that was a set that was out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, a lot of Hollywood designers, a lot of Hollywood set designers also worked as architects designing homes, and a lot of architects worked in the Hollywood business in designing sets. So there was a real cross-pollination in the physical environment. You couldn't go too far through this city without somebody filming something or some set somewhere. So we kind of grew up in Los Angeles that this was a sort of an ordinary thing. It wasn't really weird. And I think that's one of their inspirations for a lot of the people who wanted to do these tours is the fact that you could finally get backstage and see how the films were being made. That would be great. So all over Los Angeles, there were a lot of the sets, especially as you came out into the San Fernando Valley. Here's a good example. Um, you're driving down and you're passing what is now the uh, the Jim Henson Studios, which was A&M Records, which before before that was Charlie Chaplin's studio. And he built what looks like a residential facade. The same architect uh, who designed the studio also built houses for Charlie Chaplin just down the street. You had a lot of that. You had a lot of, once again, a lot of the architects were working as, um, in the movie studios, and a lot of the movie studio people were working as architects as well, too. So there was such a cross. That's why you had these kind of funky little restaurants. Uh, you had, what, Pig and Whistle. You had the Tam O'Shanter. You had, you had quite a few of these. You had the Clifton's. Clifton's, I think, is probably one of the best examples. A lot of people don't realize that Los Angeles, prior to World War II, manufactured more tires than any other city in the United States other than Akron. And so you don't just build a tire factory, you build the Babylon Tire Factory, which is the thing that's, uh, uh, the thing that's in the city of commerce, the old Goodrich thing, that the facade looked like as a Babylonian temple. So even industrial buildings had to be a little bit more showy just to take advantage of it. Coca-Cola is housed in what looks like a steamship from the 30s. So because this was a show busy kind of town, you could, you could get away with those sort of things. LA is just full of themed buildings. We have a lot of these things in this city. And it's just because the weather allows you to do it and the people are dreamers and you're not as concerned about the weather. You can design kind of whatever you want. We started off very differently than any other American city. We were governed differently than any other American city. We have an image that's different than any other American city, and we've lived up to it. it, it, it it's, a weird, it's a weird city, and that's one of the reasons why things like the Universal Studios Tour could exist and why Disneyland could be invented. Um, only really in Los Angeles could that be. When it first opened in 1955, Disneyland was the ultimate fantasy land. Its creator, Walt Disney, envisioned it as a place where his pen and ink movies would take physical form, where families could experience his timeless stories as three-dimensional worlds. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland. There was three parts about Walt Disney that fascinated me. His core expertise was a cartoonist, right? Uh -huh. and, if, and, and that's what he was doing. Yeah. And if Walt Disney would have just stayed as a cartoonist, and he was a great cartoonist, probably none of us would remember Walt Disney. 
His other talent was, as he transitioned and formed the Walt Disney Company, he ended up being a really smart business person and a manager, right? Yeah. So he had this cr incredible creative side. He had this incredible other side of his brain that was a business side, right? But even those two together, we probably wouldn't have remembered them. The third component that really made Walt Disney Walt Disney is he had vision. He had this ability to see around corners, to understand what people wanted, to tap into their lives and to make that emotional connection, and then the courage and the strength and the determination to make it happen against all odds, really at the time against all odds. Right. So to have the combination of the creativity, the business mind and the vision, I think he's a great example of an American phenomenon who changed the world in ways that nobody would have ever predicted. Walt Disney was always looking over the horizon of success for his next golden opportunity. I wanted to learn more about how the producer of groundbreaking and wildly popular animated films made the leap into an entirely new kind of business. So I visited the Walt Disney Archives in Burbank and sat down with their director, Rebecca Klein. Children, and presumably adults too, wanted to see where the magic was made. But unfortunately for logistical reasons, Disney never offered tours of its uh, of its studio, unlike yeah. unlike other uh, film studios. The original Disney Studios, the first one was in Hollywood. It was just a little storefront over on near Vermont in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and then there was a, a studio that was built they called the Hyperion Studio, which mm -hmm. was on Hyperion and Griffith Park Boulevard. It's a Gelson's now, right? Yeah, it's a Gelson's <laughs> yeah. now, exactly. And that one is where Snow White was was first, you know, animated, and also Mickey Mouse when, and Donald Duck were both born there. Um, that studio, we outgrew it almost immediately. In, and so in 1939, with the profits from Snow White, we were able to build this studio here in Burbank. And so when we, when we built this studio, almost immediately, you know, people were reading about the brand new Burbank studio and the Disney studios uh, over the hill. And people started writing to the studio and writing to Walt and saying, you know, we want to come see where Snow White lives and where Mickey Mouse lives. He knew that it would be really hard on the staff to have visitors coming through while they were working in the cramped quarters that, that even here they had. And it would be really hard for that, you know, them to do that. Sure. And so he started thinking, how can I, you know, share this with the public, how we make this magic? And that's actually what gave Walt the inspiration originally to start thinking about what he termed a kiddie park. It eventually morphed into something bigger and they announced plans to make a park. Mm -hmm. And by that time they realized that that's, that plot was much too small. So they started looking south and ended up in Orange County and found the, the land in Anaheim. So they never mm -hmm. did do tours of the studio. So this is a really special piece. This is here in the archives. One of our documents is the prospectus that they used to um, get investors for Disneyland. Wow. And so what this is, is a, it's this aerial schematic. This is a print of what Disneyland looked like in their imagination, Walt <laughs> and, and Herb Ryman. So Disney did didn't this. draw this himself. No, Herb Ryman, one of his Imagineers, uh, one of the artists here at the studio, did it with Walt standing over his shoulder. They built it in a year, right? In one year, That's yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. They couldn't do that today. No way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but they did it, and um, so they didn't have so they had artwork. So the uh, animators here at the studio, the illustrators here, um, drew what they envisioned each each land would look like. So the very first guidebook doesn't have any photographs in it; it just has has illustrations. So in order to create Disneyland, Walt Disney had to, in a sense, invent a new profession, mm -hmm. uh, the Imagineer. Right. How, how did this come about? He took some of his animators and people that were already working on animated films, very famous Imagineers like John Hench and Ken Anderson and Mark Davis. Mm -hmm. They were all working on animated films previously, but Walt knew they had this vision that they could make this happen. And wow. so it was, it was the vision of an art director who was used to creating scenic elements to give you that, that dimensional feel that you were walking into a movie was the yeah. idea. It's architecture that tells a story. Exactly, it's storytelling yeah. through architecture. And so a traditional architect didn't really get that, but he had these wonderful art directors who could work with the structural you know, engineers and architects, some amazingly talented men and women that worked with, uh, with Walt in the beginning on Disneyland. Because most of Disneyland was constructed here on the lot and trucked down to Disneyland. Really? People don't really realize that. No. Who were these fabled Imagineers who turned two-dimensional sketches into three-dimensional living stories? I wanted to meet one for myself. So I visited Disney legend Bob Gurr, the man behind the monorail and many of the ride vehicles at the Disney theme parks, to learn how he and his fellow Imagineers made a magic world feel real. 
How did you become an Imagineer? They needed somebody to do a body for a little car. They had a little chassis in the back lot, needed a car body. The way he finds people is usually uh, asking other people. Now he, he asked, had several guys in the studio that were uh, movie directors and uh, animators, and they were car guys, and they knew who I was. So I come in as the car guy. And that immediately led to Walt has ideas for more stuff, including cars. It was one thing after another mm -hmm. for uh, all those years because yeah. Walt wanted number one, Autopia, Main Street Vehicles, Omnibus. And then in 1959, he wanted the monorail, the Matterhorn, uh, the submarine, a motorboat, and a new Autopia car. All five of those projects done in the same year. Wow. And I uh, worked at Disneyland and I actually drove some of the very vehicles that I believe you designed. I drove the fire engine, I drove uh, the horseless carriage, which I believe is nicknamed the Germobile, if, that's, <laughs> if I'm right about that. Yes. Yeah, and you designed those. Yes, the, all the Main Street vehicles. We had the red car, the yellow car, we had two omnibuses, uh -huh. and then I talked Walt Disney into uh, the, doing the fire engine, because I secretly wanted a fire engine. I remember I, uh, we were always told that it was such a privilege to drive that because it was Walt Disney's favorite vehicle. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, and those cars are still in service today, 60 years later. Yes. It's impressive. Well, it's because, remember, it's because it's standard store-bought parts. In other words, from the radiator, the engine, flywheel, flywheel out, transmission, drive shaft, rear axle, out to the brakes, the stock parts. It just looks old. So, so why was it so important to make it look you know, antique. Okay, first off, it's Disneyland. Main Street is roughly 1900 to 1905, right in that area. Mm -hmm. You remember, Walt's telling stories. And when you do stories, you need to do it right. It needs to be historically correct. And look at all the architects, all the set designers. Look what they did with Main Street. So when I was asked to design the vehicles, I could see automatically what are the things you need to do as far as a vehicle design that is authentic to anybody who really understands historic cars. It might take a little more time, cost a little bit more, but I just couldn't see doing it any other way than doing it just like Walt said, just get it right. So Main Street USA sort of creates this, you walk down Main Street, you, you get the sense that you're in, well, sort of a nostalgic um, reimagining of, of a turn of the century small town. Yeah, you got to remember, uh, Walt went from cartoons, movies, television. Now we're in literally 3D walk around in the park. So every detail, the storefronts, the colors, the, the little decorations, all of that has to be completely correct. And then when you put vehicles that are modern equipment, they have to look exactly to fit that architecture and that theme design. And that's the primary job of, a, of an Imagineer? Yes, yes. He only collected people that were curious. I mean, this is absurd to ask somebody to do something that is, requires engineers, but he didn't care. He grabbed people who could figure out what he wanted and how to do it. Look at all the people that it takes to make a movie. You've got writers, you've got set designers, you have costume, all of these things to tell a story. Walt was collecting people from all over in 1954, 55, we're going to design literally a movie story, but it's going to be a tangible movie story that the guests can go in and not so much walk around. The guests can be part of that story. A lot of people miss that point. There are important differences between both places. But whenever I visit Rick Crusoe's Grove, I'm reminded of my childhood strolls down Disneyland's Main Street, USA. Southern California's fascination with fantasy lands is alive and well today. So as a real estate developer, you could build your, your centers really any way you want, and yet you right. invest them with, with so much story and so much imagination. Why do you do that? I am so passionate about architecture and about the history of architecture and trying to get architecture to be really real. And so studying what Disney did on their Main Street, um, studying what studios do in building sets, I want to design things that give you a signal that you're in a better place and you can relax, or you can have fun, or you can just be with your family. Mm -hmm. Like the trolley. Right. The trolley at the Grove was the most outrageous idea. You're gonna build a trolley in the middle of a shopping center and it actually doesn't go anywhere? 
right? I mean, think right. about it. Have you heard from people who say, you know, I'm surprised by how much I like the yes. Grove? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The people that enjoy using it enjoy the fact that it, it, it creates this space that is almost protected, and it creates a space that is a little bit of fantasy and makes you feel good. The more real I can make it, the more relevant it becomes, the more emotional it becomes for somebody, and it creates this attachment. And that's really what we're looking to do. LA's fantasy lands wouldn't exist without movie magic, but they're also the product of shrewd business people who capitalized on the public's appetite for stories. If LA is the dream factory, its products include more than film. The artfully constructed, elaborately themed fantasy lands it manufactures now belong to the rest of the world. Union Bank is proud to support Lost L.A. Additional funding for Lost L.A. made possible in part by the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, California State Library, Anne Ray Foundation, and California Humanities.